I'm Dr. Jean Sherman, founder and director of Sky, the Sherman Centre for Culture and Ideas. Sky takes you to London, where we sit down with British architect John McCaslin, CBE. He has founded John McCaslin and Partners in 1996. The firm now has offices in London, Edinburgh and Sydney. I originally met John in Sydney, albeit very briefly, in June 2018 for a CCAA event at the Museum of Sydney. Throughout the course of John's presentation at the Museum of Sydney, I found he was charming, articulate, socially engaged, concerned, and from a design perspective, his work looked innovative and quite brilliant. Following on from that moment, John and I have established quite a lengthy correspondence. Amongst other topics, we focused most specifically on hidden homelessness and post-pandemic live theatre solutions. Sky is delighted to return to the UK ahead of the Foundation's London 2021 Hub, which will be hosted in partnership with London's Design Museum. During this time, when borders remain closed and travel restrictions remain in place, Sky is thrilled to release Season 2 of our Cinephile Hub 20 documentaries. John McCaslin now joins our London correspondent and global emissary, Dollar Merrilies, author, curator, cultural consultant and treasured Sky collaborator. Thank you for joining us. So, look, I thought we might start at the, the beginning. Tell me about the town of Danoon, where you um, uh, were brought up, and a town that you're still very much engaged with today. And for um, viewers who don't know, it's on the Cal Peninsula in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Dola. I mean, Danoon is, um, yeah, I was brought up in Danoon, born in Glasgow, brought up in Danoon, and th then I was sent off, sent away to uh, a boarding school when I was 15 which was a bit of a blessing because I think without that, I, God knows what would have happened, but I think it's, um, and then Edinburgh University. So my formative years as a kid were in Dunoon and I still retain an affection for the place. Although it is a curious town, it was a famous Victorian Edwardian seaside town which sort of lost its charm, lost its audience to cheap package holidays. Everybody who would come to Dunoon, it's wet and windy, although it's scenic, it's not, you know, that's terrible restaurants, terrible hotels, everything is terrible. So people went overseas, Dunoon went into a slump, until the Americans came in 1963. Kennedy, in fact, or 1962, set up a Polaris base in the Holy Loch, which is a deep sea water loch in Dunoon, to point Polaris missiles at Russia. So it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so Dunoon went from being a sleepy, sort of down at heel town, to being at the center of you know, the CND movement in Britain, which was, you know, anti-Polaris uh, bases, and very politicized. People like Billy Connolly came to Dunoon, uh, the humble bums who were, you know, who were folk singers, protest folk singers. Paul Newman came to Dunoon, if you can believe it. So suddenly Dunoon went from being a down at heel place that had once seen better things to the center of this American community. It was about 5,000 people, American servicemen and their families came to Dunoon. So it went from, Extraordinarily. And then everybody grumbled in Danoon about the Americans. Grumble, grumble, grumble. But then when they went, but they, everybody was, it was very prosperous. Everything, property went up, American stuff was sold in the shops, taxi drivers made a fortune getting ferrying people from through the town. So everybody grumbled about the Americans, but when they left, of course, the town left back. Another depression. So it's, it's I mean, I absolutely love Danoon and, and so I still am very much a West of Scotland boy, particularly only one bit of the West of Scotland, which is sort of Danoon and Northwood. So Sutherland, Caseneth, Argyll. Um, so I'm very sort of territorial about the places I like, and I love the West of Scotland because it's sort of windswept and it's wild and it's unpopulated. It's very beautiful. And it's also quite tough. You know, the people in the West of Scotland are very tough because they were, you know, they're Difficult. very tough, very robust. 
Dunoon's close to Glasgow, it and it, you know, Glasgow is a city known for its 19th century architecture and the early 20th century Glasgow style by you know, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Were you aware of this as you grew up, or was your interest in architecture sparked by your father, who designed, I think, your well, house? Yeah, he did. Well, my father designed a house very badly. <laughs> I mean, he was a doctor, but thought he was, he was a kind of monkey architect. So he designed it very badly oriented the house wrongly, so it it, basically everything leaked, windows leaked, everything leaked. But no, he certainly had a, he had a sense of the aesthetic, I think. And so growing up in, in Dunoon, I was sort of aware of architecture. I was also interestingly aware of art, because this is how curious Dunoon is. I had a friend, my closest friend in Dunoon was a guy called Crawford Laban. I remember as we were growing up, Crawford said, Van Gogh used to live in our house. I said, Crawford, uh, I said, uh, Crawford. I went to my mom and she said, no, it's nonsense. I said, Crawford, Van Gogh couldn't have lived in this. <laughs> Van Gogh lived in our house. And then I got more and more ridiculous, but actually it wasn't so ridiculous because Van Gogh's patron, Alexander Reed, who lived with Van Gogh and his brother, Theo, and effectively was his, one of his great supporters, indeed was brought up and lived in that house and looked exactly like Van Gogh, if you could believe it. Exactly, and Van Gogh painted a portrait of him. They're dent- almost identical. So that sort of absurd connection was, was what Dunoon was. And, and so as a kid, we used to go up to Glasgow a lot. And so there's obviously Macintosh. There's Alexander Greek Thompson, who's a phenomenal architect earlier. James Salmon, Salmon Gillespie, uh, David Hamilton earlier. So Glasgow, Yes, it's a great industrial town, but it's got a great history of architecture, which predates Macintosh, extends through Macintosh, and indeed, post-Macintosh, there were some really fine firms um, and architects. Izzy Metstein, Andy McMillan from Gillespie, Kid and Coya, some really, really good practices. So it had this very distinctive architecture, which had developed from you know, the middle of the 19th century. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, you, you know, you've remained very affectionately um, connected to, to Scotland and to, to Dun Unknown, and you, your practice has a studio yep. there. Um, and one of the big projects that you undertook was the restoration of Borough Hall. And I understand your mother rang you insisting that you, you say yep. it. Well, my mother is a wonderful lady, and um, so she did. She did. We, we had built a project here, restored the, something called the Roundhouse, which was a wonderful old shed, real shed from the 1850s, as an art centre for a guy called Torquil Norman. And I, when we were doing that, I also, I'd lo- really like to do something similar in, if not Dunoon and G- Gurukh or Greenock, which are the sort of industrial towns across the Firth of Clyde. So I really wanted to do something in Dunoon. And eventually, in 2008, September 2008, almost the day the last recession began, I found out through my mother, she, she wrote me a note actually, basled in bond paper and said, you know, you've got to, you've got to, buy, you've got to do something about the Borough Hall because it's going to be demolished. It was like an instruction, sort of three lines. The Dunoon Borough Hall, which was the first theatre in Nagal built in the 1870s, was in danger of being demolished. It was derelict, hadn't been in use for about 15, probably about 15, 20 years. And so I went up to see it. And I was really taken by the local group who'd gathered together to try and save the building, run by a guy called Dave McEwen Hill, who was a kind of local agitator. Very, very difficult guy, but I liked him very much and was desperate to see the building saved. So there was somebody else who was interested in buying it, who I know was either going to demolish it or turn it into a sort of storage facility. This is the last thing the town needed. It's on the main, really nice main street. So I sort of secretly bought the building for a pound, because we, our charitable trust could negotiate and buy it from the owners who were a charitable trust, housing association for a pound, which as I always say was the most expensive pound I've ever spent, because it, it not only didn't need a huge amount of work, but I had to pay the legal fees of the other side. The whole thing was very expensive. But anyway, by Christmas of that year, so 2008, I remember we all went up, family went up to stay with my mother in Dunoon, and we had the keys for the Borough Hall, which was empty, Main Street in Dunoon was derelict. The main hall, the auditorium, sat above the street with these kind of yellow lights of the main street on, very, very atmospheric. So I took my youngest daughter in Flossie with my wife 
got the keys. It was full of plastic bags, full of bird droppings and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was really derelict. Water was pouring through the roof. And she said, Dad, how much did you pay for this? I said, a pound. She said, you were ripped off. <laughs> and she was right. But the f main thing that happened was we had our first meeting with the local people in the town who were a bit suspicious of me because although my mother lived in Danoon and I was brought up in Danoon, I'd moved away to London. So it doesn't matter if you're not in there, you're nowhere. So they began to trust me that I wasn't about to set it, you know, demolish it. And I said, I, what I really would like to do is turn it into a cultural centre, which is what I understood the group wanted to do. And I said, so what should we do first? And so Dave said, we should have an event, we should have an open house, get the building back open again. I said, brilliant. And we did that. In May of the next year, we, put, we got some money together, we paid for some, uh, some essential repairs. And in May, the following year, it opened, and there's like three and a half thousand people came. I admit it was temporarily open, but it got the building back in use, which was exactly what Torquil did at the Roundhouse. He just got it open, kind of meanwhile uses. And then from there, we got funding and completed the project. And John, was the idea about leading from the edge, about making things happen? Because you said that you were very interested in it being a prototype to demonstrate that small and remote communities are often far more receptive to high quality culture than they're given credit for. Tola, I think you're absolutely right. What I f feel very strongly is that, is, th is that smaller communities like to know there's many, many around Scotland and elsewhere, don't get enough credit for really for the, for the audience to have any sense of what is and isn't good culture. And therefore they're fed, you know, rubbish. I mean, it's felt that there is no desire to be, to be engaged in culture. And I, I, I really have always opposed that. And what I found in Danoon, as we began to sort of experiment with exhibitions. We had a Robert Maplethorpe exhibition, was the first one we had, we had an Andy Warhol exhibition. There was a huge thirst for culture and of any sort, of dance, art, doesn't matter really what it was. And we, the only reason we got funding really from the Scottish government was because we had demonstrated that Danoon was ready for that sort of, it could be an exemplar of, community, of, of, of a small community that had a thirst for culture. COVID-19 has exposed the financial fragility of the cultural sector and it's taken a huge toll on museums, on film, contemporary art, music literature and theatre. And you've been quoted as saying that architecture seems to have lost in any kind of strategy, that there's been an acceptance of the problem and a lack of imagination in terms of how looking at it could be done differently. Can you talk about a little bit more about that, but particularly in relation to your work on theatres and the prototypes that you're doing at Borough Hall? Well, I think in part, that's what I was meaning. I think in part, it's also the fact that we don't as architects even as engineers, we don't seem to be invited to the table to be part of the discussion. And so, you know, the government here, you know, brilliant, gave 1.6 billion pounds to the arts. But if you interrogate that, there isn't anything really in there for enhancing venues, getting better air, getting better ventilation, getting improved, you know, front and back of house. It's all about infrastructural elements which are uh, n nothing, absolutely great, hold, keep jobs, save jobs, absolutely. But you, know, you save jobs by getting venues back into operation because eventually those mechanisms like furlough here run out. And if you spend all the money in furlough and you haven't improved the venue and got audiences back, then what happens? And I think what I've been trying to say is, look, you have to innovate and think about how can the venue be improved? What can you do to the venue to enhance it in order that people feel safe to come back, they feel it's safe, that you can get back to the sort of 50%, 60% capacity because you can't run a, an event on 20%, it doesn't make any sense. You can shop briefly, but you can't do it over a long term. You have to get those venues back to be economically viable and demonstrate that that's feasible, particularly in London and say the Victorian and Art Deco West End theatres. So what really struck me was what we came up with was a plan of how that might happen. And we weren't really, we've made a little bit of progress here. Actually, we've had a better response in Melbourne and Sydney where we're talking to, to theatre companies there about offering to demonstrate what could happen. 
And so, in, but in Danoon, we basically got some funding to build a little retractable seating system for about 80 people in the main hall, and that's now proceeding, which will have sort of COVID-friendly social distancing. Because I thought, well, you know, if we can't do it in major theatres, we'll do it ourselves. So we managed to get funding from the Scottish Government and from an organisation called Highlands and Islands Enterprises. And there's a bit of money which the Borough Hall owed us as a family through a, um, a loan. And I said, well, we'll transfer the loan to, to a grant and that helped unlock things. So we've managed to get enough funding for it and that's proceeding. First I was in a two-man tent, then I moved up to a six-man tent, and then I built this. Four years ago, Tim started living in the woods in Somerset. This is my uh, house, <laughs> what of a better word. This is my uh, wood burner, which is very hot. Um, I have various bits of furniture. He's part of Britain's growing community of rural rough sleepers. And I needed a break from society and the people who were around me, so I thought the only way I can get it is to go into the woods, and that's what I've done. And I've been here ever since. Tim's tent is on the outskirts of the affluent city of Wells, but like many, when faced with sleeping in a shop doorway, he sought refuge instead in the countryside. Tim's tent is very different from that traditional image of urban rough sleeping that you may have. But if you look carefully around, other tents can be seen dotted in these woods. And many people come from British backgrounds. And whether they come out to the countryside because they feel safer or simply because they want to disappear, charities warn rural rough sleeping is on the rise. Hello. Hello. Naomi and Rachel work with homeless people in the area. So as you can see, some of the tents, you know, do get abandoned. Some of them are slashed sometimes um, with people coming in. They say unaffordable rents and a lack of housing means the population has risen in the last 18 months and is expected to keep on growing. It fluctuates around the seasons, but I'd say we're seeing an increase in people who are being threatened with eviction. So, and we're seeing an increase of people sofa surfing, which is a hidden form of homelessness. And it's not um, counted in any way. There is no statistic nationally that actually includes uh, sofa surfers. With months of winter still ahead, charities warn homelessness is on the rise. And Tim is part of a hidden population of rough sleepers moving from the streets to the countryside. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News in Somerset. John, also, I mean, architecture and health have always been very closely linked, um, and your health projects have include the, uh, included the Health Innovation Campus for uh, Lancaster University, am amongst others. But in this context, I also wanted to ask about homelessness. Poor health um, is widespread amongst homeless people in the UK, and a specialist task force was recently created to lead the next phase of government support for rough sleepers during the pandemic so that they can self-isolate and be provided with accommodation. But you've been working on a hidden and homeless outreach initiative since 2017. Surely any solution to homelessness needs to be a long-term one. It does. Homelessness is, uh, is a real, um, I mean, it's an issue that's been everywhere for, for many, many years. And in London in particular, it's been as, as London got wealthier and wealthier, it's forced uh, you know, it's forced people out of the centre. Hom homelessness has increased because it's impossible to find affordable accommodation. And it's a real, real issue. And it's one which is sort of swept under the carpet. And so the first thing we did was to find out, it was actually more of a planning issue rather than a design issue, we, is to demonstrate the fact that, pl that homeless shelters needed to have some sort of categorization which would allow it to be an attractive proposition for developers to build, fund and build homeless accommodation in order it could be used as part of the mix of a private development. So for instance here above a certain number of units you have to provide up to about 40 percent in a private development with affordable housing and what we said is that give homeless shelters some part of that mix. So if you build a homeless shelter for say 40 people that 
equates to, let's say, five affordable units in a development. So it became something that had a value to a developer and removed the requirement or reduced the requirement to build affordable accommodation. So that was one key move and actually was the first thing we did. And the second thing was then to look at the idea that you would bring you know, redundant buildings back into use as, because they exist, into shelter accommodation. So we did a competition which Heather Macy, who's one of our brilliant younger architects, led to develop a homeless shelter project for a charity that we've worked with for a long time called the New Horizon Youth Centre, which is a charity which where a lot of young people come to when they're homeless or if they've got issues with, you know, private personal issues and who also don't have accommodation. So the, this homeless shelter, which is designed by another practice, not by us, will provide a homeless accommodation. So it's, and of course, as you say, during the pandemic, it's become an even worsening, but it's been sort of swept, it is being swept aside. People are really, you know, that's the trouble. It's, it's like charity income is so low now. The problem of homelessness is escalating through the pandemic. So it's an ongoing, issue that we are we are very much engaged with. And hidden homelessness comes under the broader remit of pro bono social responsibilities, yep. initiatives that are take, undertaken by John McCaslin Family Trust, as well as your, your practice. The restoration of the iron market in Haiti after the earthquake and the archaeological research and conservation project in northern Morocco, Volubulus, are two examples, both very different in scale and scope. What, what is it that you're looking for when you support these initiatives? You know, from an early age, I was always interested in doing, you know, some form of social initiative. It didn't really matter. I mean, in a way, because I had a reasonably, not a, not a particularly easy childhood <clears throat> and upbringing, and then I was able to experience, you know, the very best education, and I was a beneficiary of that. And from my family background and my grandfather, my grandmother and my parents and things, you know, we always had an attitude that that was part of life's, you know, responsibility. About 20 odd years ago, my wife and I set up our family trust. And what, what I did effectively was I skimmed off profits in the firm because I was the sole owner and put as much as we could afford in the trust and build up the reserves and we got all the tax benefits. So we build up this sizable sum. Although it's not generally about giving money, it's about making things happen, those, that was one instance where actually it needed, it gave the leverage, I mean, just would never have happened. In most cases, it's time that we offer mm -hmm. and things like homelessness projects or in the project in Malawi, we built schools in Malawi. In Haiti, it was a commission actually from the owner of the building, which brought the building back to use. So to engage with young people in the pursuit of these projects, which perhaps otherwise might not be realised, is a real thrill. So we enjoy it very much. We've t we touched on homelessness, um, as a, you know, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic, but the pandemic has also impacted on changes in transport behaviour. And the strict lockdown that was imposed in the UK in March led to a 95% decrease in underground journeys in, in London. If these changes become more permanent and we have to maintain some semblance of social distancing, I was wondering how does that affect the design of major transport infrastructure Structure projects that you're involved in at the moment. So, for example, Sydney's Central Station and Waterloo stations. And, and with Sydney Central Station, you've partnered with Australian firm Woods Baggert. Yeah. Well, I think that if we, if we deal with the, the Sydney projects first, um, I think the real impact on Metro, Sydney Metro, was that the project has continued apace. I mean, it's that to me, I know the issue, I mean, the real problems in Victoria, in particular the fact that um, there is these sort of draconian processes for trying to kill the, um, wrong word, to try and abate the pandemic. Absolutely understand that, but construction, particularly infrastructure construction has continued and Central in a way has been a beneficiary of it because we're now about five or six months ahead because they've used the time in the station's barely been in use to progress the project. What we haven't really done is consider the long-term impact on the design of the station, mainly because it's 2024 and, you know, it's long enough ahead to 
hopefully bring back a degree of normality, number one. Number two is because the customer-focused design, as it's called, is, is front and centre, these projects are built with such um, an emphasis on space provision and intuitive wayfinding and all of those things. They're designed to be, to be easily used so it's, so, and, and to be open and accessible and all of those things. So they're already meeting that criteria. At King's Cross, interestingly, the, although we finished that project about eight years ago, we're now involved in one which looks at effectively a kind of temporary uh, booking hall to encourage the safe movement of people into and through the station because there are issues of capacity um, and safe trans tra safe well, it's traffic. the bottlenecks isn't and it and there are it's... bottlenecks which is the which really was which was a, effectively because of the form of the station it, may, it means that there is a there's a sort of entry exit clash which the pandemic has as in a way highlighted. So we've, res we've resolved that through what is effectively is a temporary booking hall, which will particularly or try to encourage people back onto the railway, because as you say, it's about 90% drop mm. in numbers, um, which is obviously, I mean, train operating companies lose a, losing a fortune, Transport for London is using a fortune, so and having to borrow from the government. So the, we have to make safe travel and safe transport environments in order that people will feel confident, more comfortable. Because yeah. that's the single reason, the most, that's the, the critical reason why people certainly in London are unwilling to come back to work. It's because of long commuting times and the, the, the fact that people in a crammed underground network absolutely feel unsafe. I mean, one of the things about Sydney Central, it's the, the 24 hectare central precinct is meant to be, well, it is the state's largest urban renewal project with the sandstone um, station being a centrepiece of that. But how do you ensure that it delivers on its ambitions to stimulate regeneration and street life in that urban area around Central Station? And what are some of the planning challenges that might prevent you for, from doing so? And I guess I'm thinking here about the proposed towers, which the Heritage Council have argued will result in adverse visual impacts. It's not for me to, to be critical of the way that these projects are developed, but if you look at the way the King's Cross site was, has matured over time, I mean, that's a project that's taken about 30 years from first conversations to things happening. And that's been, you know, painfully slow. But what it has meant is that things have happened at King's Cross or King's Cross Central, which otherwise might not have happened. So the historic environment, historic so archaeology on the site has been protected the mix of accommodation is different from what one might reasonably expect. So, for instance, at King's Cross, the first building there is, the, is Central St. Martin's. It's 4,500 students. It's not a commercial building. So the mix is quite different. And I think King's Cross development, um, which is obviously the benefit of the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and the Watts of King's Cross, is emerging as a, as a, as a kind of authentic piece of city because of the time it's taken to get it right. Mm. I think the danger with moving too quickly is you can end up with a kind of Hudson Yard scenario where you, know, you have five huge buildings on the Upper West Side, which only really, the only reason Hudson Yards has worked is, funny enough, is that the High Line generated you know, 10 million people using that part of Western Manhattan, which never did before. It created the the users effectively, who are now kind of not part of the Hudson Yard story, which I think is a shame. They're bypass Hudson Yards and it's effectively a privatized development. Very fast, but doesn't have great character or personality as a, you know, as a place. And I think the challenge in Sydney around Central is to find, is to identify what is it, what does it have to be? What are the absolute priorities? Well, the absolute priorities are you know, creating connections, proper connections, physical connections. It's to make it a, a real place. It's to give it time to ensure that it doesn't just consist of, you know, a deck to overbridge and, you know, two and a half million square meters of development and big towers. I mean, that's not going to create a place. And it needs to talk to the local community, of which, you know, you know our office is very close in Surrey Hills. You know, it needs to engage this, this setting. 
And so time is really important to, to, create, to ensure that, that, that the right sort of place emerges. And I think what we're finding in Central is that there's all sorts of opportunities open up to connect the station westward, to engage the little toga building that, which we've been working with, to get the right scale of, of buildings and to try, you know, to try and create a real place is central rather than just rush at it. And I suspect the pandemic, one, one positive impact is that there is more time now to kind of get it right because, you know, the commercial market and the resi market is, is impacted, which is, you know, terrible for lots of people, but will allow at least time to allow the, pro the right project to emerge because it may change forever. I mean, who's to say that you know, that there's two and a half million square meters of high value resi in offices is the right mix. So like your King's Cross scheme, um, the, the intent of the project is to um, refresh it ar architecturally into a 21st century landmark, the central station. And the adaptive reuse of historic buildings has been a hallmark of your practice. And projects have included, and you mentioned before, the Roundhouse in London, St. Albans Museum and Gallery, and the Museum of Russian Impressionism in Moscow. Wanted to ask you how you think architectural legacy should be handled. And I suppose I'm thinking here about the recent criticism of the National Trust where they've accused the National Trust of dumbing down its stately homes and its proposal to put art and antiques collections into storage so that the rooms can be used to develop new sorts of experience-based income. What are your thoughts around that? If I look at the National Trust, this might sound a little brutal as an organisation, but your know, National Trust is... I happen to think it would probably be best to have to be a volunteer organisation where, you know, part of our heritage is, you know, the idea that the, that the National Trust employs thousands of people to protect our heritage, I think is not necessarily the right way to do it. And that in those moments of potentially high unemployment, I mean, in Scotland, for instance, there's reckoned that a third of all young people potentially will be unemployed by Christmas to get young people back into training, to building things. You know, you think of what this country needs in terms of infrastructure, repair, renewal. You know, why isn't everybody employed in doing so? I mean, to me, the, the, the idea of spending three, four hundred billion pounds to sort of find a way through the pandemic and to have nothing at the end of it except unemployment seems to be catastrophic. Why there isn't a, a different way of viewing you know, the, the, this sort of entrepreneurial and skill-based training that will create jobs that for in, in areas that we need, particularly building things, skills training, all of those things. That, to me, is where the focus should be. And, you know, the, vol the, the volunteer sector, I mean, in Danoon, it's funny, we have 100 volunteers in Danoon. We couldn't possibly run the Borough Hall and anything but volunteers. And volunteers give... I mean, the number of the volunteers that we have at the Borough Hall doing this, this incredible stuff, particularly people who are slightly older, and to be part of this community venture, I think that's the way the... the, the I have to, it's probably not a very popular view, the National Trust should be... It should be a volunteer organisation, and it should create employment. Tens of thousands of people could be employed in, in repairing, repairing, renewing and updating national heritage projects. National Trust projects, well, and that would, you know, it, it would create employment. It's seen as a kind of place where, you know, it's a kind of closed shop and a rather stuffy, actually. I think it should be, the whole thing should be opened up. One of the things I wanted to ask you was about, do you think buildings retain vestiges of their toxic past, particularly in light of the debate here in England and elsewhere regarding buildings such as Harewood House, which was built on the back of the proceeds of slavery? Absolutely. I think that I don't want to touch on a sensitive subject in your homeland, but the whole Aboriginal history and how indigenous populations have been treated, same as in Western Canada, is incredibly important to address and to figure out how to you know, acknowledge, respect, acknowledge and work with that history, some of which is a, very, which is a history that people are embarrassed by or shamed by. In this country, 
you know, I went to school, Dollar Academy was founded by a slave, a, a slave owner, um, John McNabb. He made his fortune in the high seas and was involved in the slave trade. Of course, we never talked about it when I was in school. I was interested in all of this. I'd look up how Dollar has addressed that. And amazingly, they have, I mean, this has been going on for about five years, they have confronted that and have addressed McNabb's history as a kind of learn, as part of the curriculum, which I thought, well, that's pretty, this started five years ago. They've, they've acknowledged that his murky history, albeit paid for school for the poor people, effectively the religion, the poor kids of the borough, had a sort of noble aim, that there is this history that needs to be confronted. And I think that that's, you know, how far do you go I, I think you go as far as you need to, to sort of cleanse the past. I really do. And hard as that is, um, and there's a point where there will be a natural kind of end point, you know, you have to, you have to confront those issues because there's so much, you know, it's the only way you're going to get to a point where people, people feel there is a kind of base of normality to proceed with. So, you know, we had it in Bristol with Colson. And I mean, being toppled into the harbour, well, that's, fine, I mean, that needed to happen. And, you know, and that is a subject, object will go into the museum in the form, it's battered form, and you'll be able to explain the history of this. I think that's really, I mean, from an education tool, it's very important. So how did you approach this issue? So I completely issue? agree with it. I mean, so I'm curious about then how you approach this issue in Doha with the Musharraf yeah. museums, as you would have been approaching it from a, an historical as well as a contemporary perspective from the history of the forced labour in the Indian Ocean slave trade to current issues surrounding the abuse of migrant construction and domestic workers in the Gulf states. You've hit a very sensitive and difficult point for us. In the case of Doha, we firstly you know, sought advice on, on the conditions within which the labour on the site we were working on, which is the Musharraf site, where the workforce was 25,000, and, uh, and where the contractors, Turner International, we felt, with the advice that we took, this is before we even engaged, was, was about as appropriate as it possibly could be in the context of Qatar. That's the first thing. The second thing, in, in a way, is the fact that the museums that we were working on, which were effectively identified by Sheikha Musa, the wife of the Emir, was uh, addressing the issues of slavery. And there is a museum of slavery in one of the buildings. And uh, that is the key museum, which was an amazingly brave subject for her to take on and to champion. And I was interested by the, and so we designed it with the Ralph Applebaum as a museum designer, and it's quite heavy stuff, the museum addresses, both in terms of the the history of Qatar and a wider area. And that, if that for me became the outcome that we build a museum of slavery, which addresses head on those issues, that's about as far as, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. And that's not our, that wasn't our intent, it was Sheikh Amuza's intent as one of the four museums. But my God, I mean, it's incredibly powerful what she, what she promoted, championed, and you know, put her name to. I mean, one of the other projects that you did in Doha was Musharraf Mosque. But it's not the only architecture of faith that you've undertaken. You also did Friends House in London and the Sacred Heart Cathedral in Kirisho. How do you define architecture of faith in this secular and virtual age? And what's, what's our relationship with these buildings, with these places of worship now? If I talk for a moment about Kirisho, the, the issue there was that we were we were invited through, it was interesting that we were invited, we were invited through a Scottish architect to, I gave a talk at one of this Royal Institute of Architects in Scotland conference in, in Dundee, which is a very difficult history with slavery, I can, you know, it's jute mills and God knows what else. I mean, it's very, very difficult. But I talked specifically about the initiatives projects we were doing, looking at schools in Malawi and various other things. And in the audience, there was a chap who, whose daughter, funnily enough, worked for the uh, American executive who was, trying to, who was wanting to build a cathedral in Kirichu for a bishop who he'd gone to university with. And so we were invited to participate in it. And 
So the existing design was scrapped and we took over, which I have to say the existing design was, a, was, an, was very expensive and we felt was inappropriate because it was a sort of monumental edifice in this place. And so we, were, we took the project over, we started it again. It was built very um, simply, local materials, um, uh, expressed the local sort of vernacular. And critically, we added in a kind of educational component to the brief, which meant that it was not just a cathedral, which was incredibly important, but also the education and community space. And so we sort of enriched the program of space and I think it worked better because of that. Those are, I mean, really important projects to, to kind of get right and to get the expression right in the, in the particular context that they're within. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. I'm Dr. Jean Sherman, founder and director of Sky, the Sherman Center for Culture and Ideas. You've been watching a Sky Virtual Hub episode. This episode has been proudly supported by the Sky Cinephile Circle of Private Patrons. We are grateful for their generous assistance alongside a number of commercial, educational, cultural and government organisations, including the City of Sydney. More episodes are available for you to enjoy at sky.org.au. Thank you for joining us.